Welcome everybody. Join me on a hike today. We're going to be walking into a lake as I discuss some of the fundamental terrain principles. This is going to be introductory. It's going to be a basic overview, straight talk, terrain, model of health. The first point that I want to make is that, of course, this is not a theory. You know, the terrain framework of understanding things, the terrain paradigm, you know, it, it, it's not a theory. And you may say that, the, you know, this is just semantics, it's just words. Um, but really, it doesn't fit into the category of a theory. You know, it's not something that we've induced based on many hypotheses. It's truly an a priori understanding that our external environment affects us internally and that, you know, our terrain and our environment is everything. You know, even something like the germ theory would technically fit under this terrain paradigm, this terrain framework, you know, because if germs in our environment made us sick, if the presence of a germ made you ill, that would actually fit within this terrain understanding. And so this really brings me to one of my first points, uh, one of the major claims of the terrain movement, you know, everyone sort of in this terrain understanding understands very well that, you know, germs don't cause disease. Now, again, this is not a terrain theory versus a germ theory. This is just the fact that the presence of germs in your environment do not cause disease. Now, there are many ways to approach this. Now, there are many ways to approach this argument. For me, the most convincing thing when I was in my undergraduate in biochemistry and molecular biology was reading the contagion studies conducted throughout the years. There are hundreds of contagion studies that use very you know, natural methods of contagion, and some even use very unnatural methods of contagion, and they lack results. You know, In these contagion studies, these hundreds of contagion studies, trying to introduce sick people to healthy people in controlled settings does not make the healthy people sick. They've done these studies with chickenpox, polio, measles, the Spanish flu, notably, there are very large studies with the Spanish flu. They've done it with gonorrhea, syphilis, HIV, you name it. Introduction of any sort of germ has not been shown to, to show any sort of immune response to show any sort of symptom or disease. You know, the only way to actually introduce some sort of disease into an individual is through the addition of an adjuvant. This is why in cupcakes, our little injections, we have to add heavy metals to stimulate an immune response. And there are some studies out there, even some Koch's postulate studies that introduce a microbe alongside other toxins. And you know, the terrain claim is that the toxins in our environment are what actually cause disease, you know? So getting back to the scientific method here, you know, trying to introduce some sort of purity, some sort of isolation of a germ into a healthy terrain, a healthy environment, you know, a healthy individual does not produce symptoms without the addition of an adjuvant or toxin. Furthermore, with the scientific method, you know, we're looking at a falsification of methods here, you know, to put it very technically, because I would say that, you know, this falsifies the germ theory completely or everything that the germ theory stands for. Um, but, you know, it falsifies the methods for sure. So these hundreds of contagion studies that tried to introduce sick people and healthy people in some sort of isolation or in some sort of you know, quarantine where there's no external factors coming in and out. It's really true that, you know, when you go and read these studies, none of them are diseased. None of the healthy individuals are diseased. You cannot spread from one individual to another through these natural methods of, you know, sneezing, coughing, even swabbing mucus from an in another individual to another individual. A great starting point is the Rosenau experiments back in 1918. Uh, and this is a phenomenal study. It was the first study that I read on the topic that was <laughs> truly convincing because it was a pure Popperian falsification of the methods. And this is largely dismissed. And the claim that the moderns will make is that it was a primitive understanding. And I've had many people who are vehemently against the terrain movement, 
you know, or very for the germ theory movement, microbiologists, PhDs, they say, you know, it's not a falsification of the germ theory, it's a falsification of the methods. And I, you know, I got to completely agree with them there. If these methods of natural contagion are falsified, I completely agree. If the only way to produce contagion is through introduction of toxicity or very, very meticulous ways of introducing, you know, disease, not through isolation of a pathogen, I completely agree. That's, that's what the terrain principle fully stands on. So if germs don't cause disease, what does? Fundamentally, it's toxicity deficiencies and traumas whether they be physical traumas you fall and break your leg or a psychological trauma where you you know are experience some sort of traumatic event um, that is has plays it takes a toll on your mind that leads you into some sort of maladaptive pattern these psychological traumas of course manifest physically as well it's really unimportant to distinguish the two and split all the fields uh, if you're taking a true holistic perspective now, what I mean when I say toxicity, I mean anything that is unnatural is a toxicity. You know, when we are creating these substances, these on a very basic chemical level, we create these foreign objects, foreign to our body and to our realm. You know, there are even natural things that are toxic as well, like heavy metals, formaldehyde, you know, alcohol, things like these. These are all unnatural and this is where it becomes um, even though they're natural this is where it becomes you know the point where excess is a toxicity right so too much of something in excess is a toxicity but if it's foreign to our realm and very synthetic and man-made you know where do you draw the line there go check out this video for that but it's really important that you understand that everything in excess is a toxicity and everything in that is foreign, no matter what the quantity is, is in excess and is toxic. When it comes to things like deficiencies, we're getting into a slightly different discussion. You know, many people would say, you know, deficiencies of vitamins or minerals, and partially I could agree with that, especially the mineral part of it. You know, we are deficient in real food. That is where I draw the line. You know, if you are eating processed food, of course you're gaining some sort of toxicity. Uh, but you're definitely missing out on vital key components of our being that are in real food. So deficiencies include deficiencies in nature, deficiencies in love, deficiencies in sunlight, deficiencies in real food is the most important one here. Now these can all of course cause disease and psychological traumas might necessitate a larger conversation surrounding the topic but you know I think we can kind of break it down to any sort of state that is undesirable to the individual because even a trauma is is very individual what might be maladaptive to one might be helpful to another depending on the individual's goals and dreams and aspirations but i think i've made my point so it might be helpful here to sort of define disease as per the terrain view you know disease is not good or bad just like health is not good or bad and realistically, the terrain movement would likely take a stance that disease is a good thing. You know, you want to be displaying symptoms if you are burdened by toxicity or deficiency. The reason being is because our symptoms, our diseases, are, this is our body trying to heal itself, right? So when I say that, you know, these symptoms like a cough, a cough fundamentally physiologically is our body trying to get rid of something in our lungs right mucus neutralizes toxicity you know vomiting or even movement of the bowels you know or you know, all these things are excretions sweating a fever is one of the best ways to excrete toxins one of the most natural ways to do so we're getting into pretty thick territory here but uh you know, when I, when I say that, you know, it's really important to understand that symptoms are our natural healing processes. They are, they are our medicines, you know, so really we're trying to support our symptoms when it comes to, when it comes to our, our diseases and, and things of this nature. So, you know, what is health? Now, if you're, if you're interested in what is health, I ask all of my guests this on my podcast. It's my introductory question. 
So when it comes to health, you know, of course, health is very individual. And I think that's a really important point to make. You know, it depends on your goals, you know, your ability to, to do things. You know, so health really is, you know, a state of being. It's a homeostasis. It's never something that you really achieve, but it's something that you're always striving to achieve, you know. So trying to figure out, you know, what health means to you. It means your ability to achieve your goals and dreams. Healthy is thriving with what you got, with what was given to you, and achieving your best possible version of yourself. You know, so health is very individual, and, you know, it's really important to have some sort of understanding of what health means to you. Now, I think objectively we could say that disease is the body trying to heal itself because, of course, the body is trying to reach some sort of homeostasis, some sort of balance, uh, and that truly is the purpose of health. And this kind of brings me to my next point, you know, what is the purpose of germs? If, you know, the claim certainly isn't that germs aren't present at the site of disease, they certainly are present at the site of disease. And that's a very important point to stress, you know, um, germs, speaking of parasites, fungus and bacteria, of course, you know, so what's their role? Largely, it's bioremediation. And this big fancy term is essentially means, you know, cleaning up the environment. You know, they are the garbage men. They're the, gar they're the garbage disposal system. And they are the ones that actually convert the garbage into something useful that our bodies can use. So really that's the, the purpose of these microbes is bioremediation. And another term that's used in the literature is bioaccumulation. You know, these things can store high amounts of toxicity, things like heavy metals, pesticides, etc. So, you know, that's pretty much uh, the point of microbes. So they are present at the site of disease. Like our symptoms, they're there cleaning up our environment. And of course, bacteria are, and fungus and even parasites are part of a natural order as well. And, you know, this is really an important point to stress too. You know, they aren't just pathogens, but even pathogens, although aren't present always in our natural order, they are always a beneficial symbiotic piece of us. Now, when it comes to the discussion of viruses, this is a slightly different conversation, you know, because viruses generally are laboratory artifact and objectively you know there's very little evidence of their existence or role or purpose even exosomes uh, anything of this nature is kind of slim when it comes to where you draw the line of what is the laboratory artifact what is the purpose you know we can't study these things in isolation um, and the experiments like cell culture have been falsified by gentlemen like jamie andrews or dr stefan lanka so it's really important to know that that's a completely different conversation and i have videos that kind of go into that as well if you want to check this one out as a pretty comprehensive one i'll also put a text down below that i wrote which is pretty comprehensive on the methodologies used and and why they're circular uh virology largely is a big circle of reasoning uh, and is a complete pseudoscience so a big question you're probably asking is why we perceive contagion it certainly seems like we went to the grocery store the other day and we're around some snotty kid and got sick you know and we do perceive contagion and there is a phenomenon of contagion out there but it's not contagion of germs it's contagion of toxic environments right and that could be toxins that could be psychological toxins you know psychologically we tend to mimic those around us our mirror neurons you know yawning is contagious uh, even women syncing up on their cycles is sort of a contagious phenomenon, right, on the psychological level. So largely why we perceive contagion is for those two reasons. You know, either people share a toxic environment, you know, people in close proximity tend to go to similar locations. Homes can be very toxic. They can have a lot of toxic building materials. When they get damp, they get aerosolized. Um, so you're leaking things into the air like formaldehyde and um, stagnation of the air in the house if you're not opening your windows so things like that schools can be very toxic same as um, grocery stores or even churches all these building materials are very very toxic the lighting is toxic the stagnant air so there's many different avenues and why this can be toxic and then the psychological phenomenon you know we can't negate that you know the fact that we tend to mimic people around us you know it's it's undeniable it's absolutely undeniable um, it, it, it's placebo our mind is the most powerful thing out there 
Um, and I think that's a really important understated point when it comes to all this, you know, but it's certainly the case and it may seem kind of crazy, but then again, it's like, how can you explain women's cycle syncing up or why yawning is contagious? You know, and our, our minds can be tricked as well, right? Because from birth, we've been ta- told what contagion is. And, you know, if that's the predominant understanding, you know, we're going to f- slip into that way of thinking. Back in the day, they thought scurvy and beriberi and all these different deficiency diseases were contagious because everyone on the ship got it at the same time. But they were overlooking some large confounding variable that being a deficiency at the time and uh what you got there merle (laughs) some garbage and now you know we're overlooking toxicity and we live in the most toxic world around us you know microplastics industrial cleaners electromagnetic frequencies non-native ones of course you know we have an epidemic of a lack of nature and sunlight you know we're constantly on our screens with blue light which should disrupt our circadian rhythm we're not sleeping you know, it's, it's, a, it's a whole cycle of things, right? So um, it's really important to understand that, you know, there are a lot of phenomena and a lot of things that make us sick. And the problem is, is that you need to be responsible and take accountability for yourself and your loved ones, those around you. You know, uh, when we realize that we are making ourselves sick, we realize that we can heal ourselves largely through cutting out toxicity and implementing that which we are deficient in. You know, eating whole foods again, moving our body, you know, that's a big deficiency nowadays. We are not moving. We sit for hours and hours and hours a day, um, removing toxicity like blue light, like non-native electromagnetic frequencies, you know, all of these processed foods, you know, that goes hand in hand with addressing deficiencies. So. It's all about taking responsibility. Realize that your environment is everything. Your external environment is a representation of your internal environment and vice versa. So you really need to ensure that your thoughts are correct. You need to ensure that your environment is correct as well. And you need to take responsibility for that. Don't give your autonomy or responsibility to anyone else. No one else can heal you. Even the allopathic doctors admit that it is your body healing itself just with the aid of their pharmaceutical drugs. But let's be real, no one's deficient in pharmaceutical drugs. Not to say that emergency medicine is not necessary at times to prolong life, maybe reduce suffering. But then again, when it comes to things like chronic illnesses, even infectious illnesses, you want to rethink how you're going to go about healing those because it seems as though they're climbing and climbing and climbing. Hope this introduction was clear. If you have any questions, leave them down in the comments. I'll be sure to get to them at some point. I love chatting with you guys. You can also reach out to me on Instagram. I monitor the DMs there, even though I'm not posting very much. Give us a subscribe. We're going to give a book away at 1,000 subscribers. The Structure of Scientific Revolutions, an absolutely phenomenal work that ties into what we're discussing here. So make sure you do that. Give us a like, share, comment, whatever you got to do to support me. I really appreciate that. I hope you guys all enjoyed this. Take care.